Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here at your school, if you did invite me. Um, the, these slides, the visual material may be a little chaotic. I don't remember whether it's all chronological or not, and I think it looks okay, so I'm not embarrassed, but I have no idea what speed they're going to go or what, what's going to happen, you know. So anyway, just bear with me. I'll make comments as I go along for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then I'll answer questions, and, and that's the program. Uh, this particular picture here on the screen was made about seven years ago. Um, it's a still life in the bedroom, and was shown in the city here. <laughs> What can I say? It's painted with acrylic. I'm going to, if possible, keep my comments about art and sort of skip uh, personal stuff pretty much. I just want to sort of present my art and leave it at that. So uh, next. Okay, this is... Uh, a story of a, a Neptune from a little bit earlier. Um, you see my cartoony art style, which you probably know. Um, how was this devised? How did I get into this? Well, on an intellectual level, it seemed to me that after Pablo Picasso, art would never go back to looking uh, realistic again. This is me thinking 1948-50. It seemed in 1948-50 that realism was all gone and that Picasso had finished it off. Th this is me without a shred of knowledge. <laughs> I didn't know a thing. I decided to be an artist before I knew anything about the art world, or, or even that I knew there was an art world here in the United States. My sole information was Time and Life magazine in the late 40s, which actually was not such a bad source of knowledge as you might think. They, they, they were generous. They gave a lot of attention to art in those years, and all kinds of art, everything from Jackson Pollock to Paul Cadmus, everything you can imagine. Uh, in Time Magazine, I read about Buffet, Du Buffet, and many other artists. But I didn't find out a single thing, really, about the art world of the United States. It was a complete mystery to me. I, I, I decided to be an artist in 1950 because I didn't like the look of things that were going to happen to me. I didn't feel like commuting downtown getting in a car and driving to an office building and sitting and talking about money at a desk. Now, that didn't seem to me a romantic life. Um, so it was a terrible tragedy in my family when I said I wanted to be an artist. To be an artist in 1950 is like being transgender right now. <laughs> I mean, your parents would literally faint and you'd have to revive them practically. So anyway, I, I became an artist and I went to art school, Washington University. Next. Here's George Bush at Abu Ghraib. <laughs> uh, these are fairly large acrylic paintings. That, uh, uh, these first ones seem to be fairly recent. Anyway, so I, I went to art school in St. Louis, and I graduated uh, in 1956. And um, I went right away to Europe. I had a girlfriend who was thought, who was sort of like-minded to me, and we decided to go to Europe and live a beautiful life. We, we pictured a life where we could do crazy stuff on canvas and send these works to some art gallery somewhere in the world, and money would result. <laughs> it was a very simple view of life, and, and one that suited me. And uh, so after a certain length of time, a certain number of years, it actually came true. I was able to do this. 
So by the age of 30, I was walking around cities in Europe, not understanding a single thing in the language situation. I'd never spoken any languages. I was just painting all the time. And uh, living among beautiful buildings. Um, next. Here we have uh, Fort Defiance. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, as I think of things to say, I'll just say them without regard to whether or not they pertain to the picture. Um, people have often asked me in the last uh, 30 or 40 years why there's so much sex and violence in my pictures. Actually, I'm quite a normal person. So why is this going on? Why, is that, why are people always getting shot full of arrows, bullets, and so on? Why is there sexual torment, and so on, and so on? Why is this happening? For some reason, and I, don't, I can't explain this very well, but when I was very young and started art, like 48, 1947, 48, 49, in there I made my very first paintings, for some unknown reason, I thought my personal life was of no interest whatsoever. Just zero, zilch. So I thought, God, I can't paint my life. My life isn't worth painting. Nobody would ever look at it. So I simply released myself from the demand that you tell the truth. And I decided to say anything whatsoever in my paintings, just anything. Like if I want to picture, paint a picture of an earthquake, I paint a picture of an earthquake. It doesn't mean a thing that I haven't seen an earthquake, thought of an earthquake previously, or done anything else about it. Same goes for everything. I just simply relaxed on the truth angle and decided to just do anything. And you know, I still am to this day. My actual physical experience is rather little. Next. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, the whole thing is made up. I just make things up, one picture after another. This picture is from about 20 years ago, maybe. 20 years ago, something like that. He's in bad shape. And these are acrylic paintings. Next. Oh, yeah. This is marriage. <laughs> He's got the wrong attitude. <laughs> but they're happy anyway. I don't understand why it is that modern art in America is asked to be so boring in a way, to not have any psychology in it. I mean, if you go into an art gallery in this country, you're more likely to see geometric designs than anything. I can never understand why this is. I mean, I can look at geometric designs for like 25 minutes if I have to. But I mean, really, when it comes to psychology, it's so much better. I love it. Um, next. Here's de Kooning's woman <laughs> from uh, not too long ago, not, not too many years ago, five or six. It's, uh, I, I have been interested in art too, but unfortunately, uh, my life is characterized by a lot of isolation and lack of information, which is my own fault. I, I, I was not denied information, really. After I got to art school, I had the normal experiences that people have at art school, and, uh, I mean, I got to reading the Art News magazine. I knew who de Kooning was. I knew who Jackson Pollock was, the whole thing. I mean, so why don't I have any knowledge of these things, really? Why was I not involved? Why did I not partake of the same things that my fellow art students partook of? I don't know. There is no excuse, really. I, I, this is my contact with modern art. I sometimes make a version of somebody else's picture. It's not to be insulting, and it's not to be praising. 
the objective of the picture of somebody else's picture is I lean on them to get some kind of fame going, if you know what I mean. I mean, they, there's somebody well known, there's some sort of something like that going on. Next. Oh, here's Stalin. Yeah, yeah. He's winning World War II. World War II does always interest me, although I was too young to experience it. I, I, I like knowing about it, and I'm a total sucker for any sort of memoirs, especially of Jewish people, and any memories of tragedies, horrors, things of that nature, executions of war criminals. I'm, I'm, that's the kind of thing that I, I go for under normal circumstances. I can be interested in other things, too. Next. <laughs> yeah, here we have a, another artist's work. Max Beckman, German artist that uh, you may know, or not, I don't know. Um, he painted a picture called The Night. The Night, N-I-G-H-T. Um, back in 1919, I think. So this is my new version. Needless to say, these don't sell like hotcakes. <laughs> One of the weak points uh, of, of people, basically, in my opinion, is they're more interested in something nice than something interesting. I mean, I, I can't have anything around that I look at that's not really interesting. But I don't care about nice. Nice is like you know, neither here nor there. Next. Here's a North America, kind of a map of. Crashing airplanes have always interested me because actually I missed the first mid-air uh, collision by sleep, by not by sleeping in late, but by simply being too lazy to go to the airport. That was in 1956. Uh, the first mid-air collision was over the Grand Canyon and it was the flight before mine from St. Louis to San Francisco. So I, I um, I, I just deliberately sat at the table in St. Louis and read the comics to sort of thwart my father, I think. Anyway, anyway, I, when I got off the airplane in San Francisco, there were these, uh, there was the headline in the paper, airplanes collide in midair, 129 killed. So I realized that by reading the comics, I'd saved my life. Otherwise, I would have, would have been on that plane. Um, next. Here we have Cowboy. This is a painting called Cowboy. It's quite recent. This was shown in Los Angeles not much more than a year ago. It's, it's my attempt towards a certain kind of abstraction. Abstraction has so far baffled me. I, I, I want to take part in that, too, because I don't have any beliefs or standards. I mean, I'm ready to paint any picture. If I want to paint a picture, it's as good as painted. I don't have any thoughts like, you know, quality, like, you know, one kind of picture is better than another. I think abstraction is okay. The only difference between abstract painting and a realistic painting, the way I see it, is the abstract painting, you don't know what it is. Otherwise, it's the same thing. <laughs> Next. <clears throat> Here's a, another quite recent painting. That one, the, the last one was shown in Los Angeles. The, this one is shown in um, uh, London. Uh, anyway, oh, I also, if, in case there's art students in the audience, I sort of think there is, I have a technical tip for using acrylic. Um, you, you may know this already, but 
Acrylic has a dead and dry look that people have always complained about. Ever since I started using acrylic in 1964, 68, I started using acrylic in those years. Um, acrylic has a dead look that people have told me about over and over again. It said, look, you can't tell the dark green from the dark blue. It's just one dead color and so on and so on. And it is true, but you know what you can do? You can glaze it with another kind of paint and it just perks right up and it looks good again. And I've been doing this during most of my life, I guess, and it works great. In recent years, the last 10 about, I use Stay, Stay Wet Acrylic by Golden. You know, they have this two brands. They have a, a normal brand of acrylic and then they have another kind that supposedly stays wet for a month. Actually, it doesn't. It stays wet for about two hours. <laughs> but, that's, but that's enough. That, that's plenty of time. And it refreshes the paint. It refreshes the uh, acrylic paint. It makes it look just as good as oil paint. In fact, better. Uh, you may not agree. I don't know. This is sort of my idea how, of good looking. Next. Oh, well, that last one was Superman and Superdog meet God in the asteroid belt. This here is the cowboy's last drink. I think what we're seeing is recent work, very recent, because um, I designed my slideshow that you're seeing tonight about four years ago. And I haven't altered it, but I just add two or three pictures every once in a while. When I have a show or something like that, I just add a couple of pictures. Why not? So this is uh, from about a year ago, this picture. Next. Here's Rembrandt's Night Watch. Which is, which is currently on the wall. You can see this painting at the Mary Boone Gallery. It's there right now. Was shown at Miami, I think a year ago. Uh, I left out some figures that weren't convenient. I mean, I don't in any way mean to sort of be loyal to some picture that I'm doing a version of. It's not a loyalty thing, and it's not a seeking for quality necessarily. It's this that is useful to me to lean on this other artist for some reason. Okay, next. Oh, yeah. And this is on the wall right now, too. This is called global warming. <laughs> it's the selection of problems of the last day, sort of. <clears throat> He's got a squirrel on his shoulder. The idea of death by sweating has occurred to me in the subway sometimes. <laughs> so I thought, well, why not, you know? I I'm not sure that the color is always good in these. You'll have to excuse the quality of the uh, digital. <clears throat> Next. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, this is um, Trump. Oh, yeah. This is Trump in Florida. <clears throat> now, now uh, Trump is a very difficult subject because I, I've done politicians a fair number of times, and usually I treat them psychotically. I mean, you know, I tear them apart. I, dis I disgrace them, you know what I mean? I disgrace the politico. It seems to me a fun thing to do. And I started doing this when I was living in San Francisco, near to San Francisco, back in the uh, 60s. I started with Nixon and Johnson, and I got into Reagan. But usually, if not always, I was first with the subject. So I got the total thrill of doing it, and I could do anything I want. But in the case of uh, Trump, I'm like number 10,000 among artists who have painted him. <laughs> it's really a difficult situation. So I couldn't just do a normal negative number on him. It had to have some sort of uh, 
psychology that was not 100% negative. So I had him change into a crocodile somewhat. And I was expecting a great deal, not a great deal, not just a certain amount of negative vibration from people I know for not being tough enough on this guy who was considered such, such a bad president, even by me, I'll admit, you know. And I thought, God, what am I going to do? Well, nothing. I, I, the response has not been that negative, so I'm pleased enough. But uh, after I finished my two Trump paintings, I realized the only really refreshing picture of Trump has to be positive. And, and that's a hard picture to paint. So I'm painting it right now. I, I figured out how to do it. All I did was change his gender. He becomes a woman. <laughs> and as a woman, he can do all the good things. Because everybody knows that women are better, right? <laughs> so my current painting, you can see it in Miami if you go to Miami, if, if they have a Miami due to storms and whatnot. Uh, next. Oh, here's the Alamo, Return to the Alamo. This is one of my favorite recent paintings. I like the complexity here and the attitude. Um, this is dedicated to um, cartoon violence or, and or cheap sensationalism. I don't know why these things are looked down on. I feel very, very defensive about cartoon violence. I like it a lot, and I don't care what other people say. And the same goes for cheap sensationalism. It's my goal. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. I'm 83 years old, and it's still my goal. And I don't see why sensationalism is always described as cheap. It's not. A lot of gunplay here. Notice these Mexicans, they have lousy uniforms, but they know how to handle those under the arm cannons. <laughs> Except for the guy on the right, who's been sort of, who's gone bye bye. This picture should be shown in Texas, I think. Next. Oh, now we're going back a few years, like four or something. Ring, whole lot of ears. Uh, okay, what can I say? I actually forget how many pictures I've got on this uh, machine, so next please. Huh? But it goes back beyond that, doesn't it? Yeah, keep going. I mean, as long as there's new images, just keep going. Because, I mean, I, this is unfortunate in a way. The machine has sort of betrayed my urge to show you my work. This is uh, cake and pie make love. <laughs> as is obvious, right? I mean, what else could it be? Actually, I've made three versions of this. The be the, but I'm, I have, I'm afraid the first one was the best, and I don't think I have a slide of it. I, I don't think I, I do. It's unfortunate. It, it's in a museum, and I could get a slide of it. It's in, it's in France, in Paris. There, there's a third museum, little known to the east, and that's where it is. Next. Oh, here's my response to Warhol, I guess. <laughs> like I said in the catalog, I, I felt a, a little uncomfortable about tearing into his tin can uh, without doing something equally nasty to myself. So I made myself really half dead looking. Thought that would be like, okay. One thing I could never under hey, one thing I don't understand about U.S. art taste at all, it baffles me, is why do people want to see photographs or paintings of things they've already seen? 
this is just incredible that someone would, would, would want to see a photograph or painting of a Campbell soup can. It just doesn't occur to me that that's possible because it's something you've already seen. Likewise, the electric chair. I, w I would only look at a painting of an electric chair if somebody was in it getting fried. If nobody's getting executed, forget it. It's just a chair. Uh, next, please. Oh, yeah, raccoons painting a picture. Here I am leaning on Jackson Pollock a little bit, you know. <clears throat> the idea being that it's sort of slightly accidental, splashing around. Well, like, this is just a, a, a parade of imagery, really. That's all I got to show. Next. Next. Oh, here we go. Oh, wait, wait a second. Back one. Can you go back one? Oh, here we go. This is my first shark. Shark in a bathtub. You know, I, I like both kinds of paintings. I like the kind of painting where you plan it out. Like my current painting is planned out. But I also like the kind of painting where you don't plan it out, where it makes itself up as you go along. This painting, for instance, is made up as I went along. I had no idea what I was going to do as I started it. Like, well, let's do a shark. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's see what happens. I don't want to follow rules, including my own, if it's possible. Although I, at the same time, I don't mind following rules. You know, I mean, I'm full of contradictions because I see nothing wrong with contradictions. Next, a businessman commits suicide. I've done this picture several times. I think it's a good subject. Not because I don't like business people, quite the opposite. I've had much better luck with business people than I have with intellectuals. No kidding. <laughs> In spite of the fact that these are as hard to sell as you can imagine, I've actually had much better support from the business community than the intellectual community. There's something about the intellectual community and me that doesn't get on. I, I leave that to your imagination. Next. Uh, yeah, here's the Rembrandt picture. Rembrandt's uh, beef. But changed to modern, Donald Duck. I've been using Donald Duck since way back there in my first art show, 1962. Um, Yeah, okay, next. Next. Whoops. Okay, hey, what, what happened was those were all recent paintings. Now we're going to see some from early days, I guess. See, see what happens. Oh, that's it. This is the biggest painting in my first art show, January 1962, when very, I was very, very lucky. I coincided exactly with pop art. Lichtenstein and Rosenquist had their show, their first shows at this very month, January 62. And happily, I coincided with that, and people saw a slight resemblance between my things and their things. And this was very, very beneficial to me. I even, I, I even had the weird experience of having an art collector from the United States. I was living in Paris, and I didn't visit New York City to see my show. Due to pro-communist attitude, I'm not going to travel 20 feet to see a businessman was my attitude then. I don't feel that way now. Good friends with him. Anyway, uh, I actually had the experience of having an art collector from the United States look me up, and my name was written on the back of an envelope along with all these other names, Lichtenstein, Rosenquist, 
all various people, you know, and he said, which one are you? <laughs> Someone had given him this list. I was totally amazed and maybe charmed. I don't know. I mean, modern art is really pretty weird, you know. <laughs> I try to coincide with art appreciation, but it's useless. Next. This is from my very first show, too, a bit earlier. You would think, oh, the first one was an icebox. This is a, a ship, it looks like. Random imagery. You would think I had been painting abstract expressionistically, but this is not actually true. What happened was we were in Europe, and uh, we ran out of money, <laughs> finally and totally. <laughs> There was nothing, and at that very moment, we got expelled from Holland because we hadn't bothered to get visas when we came in a year before. We were just, you know, living there like we wanted to. And the local cop wanted to see our passport, so that was it, you know, we had to get out. So there was nowhere to go but Paris. And actually, that was a lucky break because Paris was a place where they had art galleries. I was in Holland because my girlfriend wanted to paint there. She had little practical sense, in my opinion. I mean, she didn't give a damn about art galleries or anything like that. She just wanted to express herself honestly and paint the landscape. So I had to be there too, painting landscapes. But anyway, so we got to Paris, and there was nothing, no way out of it. I had to make some compromise. I had to have an art career right then. So I said, well, let's see what's going on. And, it, and I looked in the bookstore windows and there was these big art books, fancy looking things about American artists, de Kooning and so on. So I thought, that must be it. I give up. I'm going to paint that way. So I started immediately painting abstract expressionistically right then. And uh, I don't know, after a few months, after less than a few months, I began to inject subject matter into it. Next. And here's an example of subject matter injected. Oh, this is, yeah, this is 62. <laughs> this is uh, done with crayon, I guess. Th this is uh, work on paper, probably about 30 inches high and 20 inches wide, something like that. Next. This is an icebox. Actually, the icebox achieved some popularity, so I, I ended up painting about eight or nine iceboxes. And after, as soon as I was successful, we celebrated by moving to Rome, Italy, because Paris seemed gloomy, it seemed gray, desperate, also having been really, really poor, we wanted a change. Now we had money. It was amazing. Modern art worked for me. It worked. I mean, just the opposite of what you would think. <laughs> Next. Here's another icebox. Next. Here's Superman in a jam. Now you see, I... I these were painted spontaneously. These were not uh, um, planned in advance very much, I don't think. This was painted in Rome, Italy. Must have been 1963, something like that. Maybe 64, I don't remember. My relationship to Mad Comics should be clarified right here. Uh, what happened was I saw the magazine, Mad Comics, on a table in a bookstore called The Mistral as a collector item. There was photo play and Argosy and, you know, horror comics and all these things from America on this big table and, we were in, and they were for sale, for, rather expensive like five dollars or something like that. So I just picked up the Mad Comics and looked at it for a moment. 
and realized that the thing that I had totally forgotten about was telling a story. For some unknown reason, I can't describe it because I don't know anything about it, modern art in America, up until pop art and maybe beyond that, was very, very clean. There was nothing in it but intelligent design. Who knows why that happened? I have no idea. But, but there was a lot of intelligent design in America and zero stories in the modern art, even though there were stories everywhere else. There were stories on TV, stories in the movies, stories in the books, you know, stories everywhere. The whole culture was filled with stories except modern art, which was pristine, clean, intelligent, and all by itself had nothing to do with anything but itself. So I thought, oh boy, this is a rule I can break. And I immediately broke the rule. I went right to where I was painting, American Students and Artists Club, Boulevard Raspai, and began just like that. I just suddenly, it only took me about half an hour to get from the bookstore seeing mad comics, which I never looked at again, by the way. It's a totally stupid thing. But it doesn't matter. It gave me the idea. OK, next. Here's Mad Doctor. This is one of the last paintings I made in Europe before returning to the United States. Pretty complicated. Actually, there's probably, unless you're looking at, unless you're used to looking at imagery, this is probably um, too much imagery to be absorbed. You can find my work on various websites, I think. So if you're really interested, you can look me up. Next. Here's another criminal type. I was very interested in crime. Next. Here's a man in an electric chair. I think that's 64. Yeah. Uh, next, oh, Donald Duck crucified. <laughs> oh, uh, the way this idea came to me, I'm going to make a couple of more paintings having to do with God up in the sky, pointing certain things out. The way this idea came to me is that in Rome, Italy, uh, I lost my art studio. It's too complicated to go into here, but anyway, I had no place to paint. There we were out in the country. What am I going to do? I got to paint. And um, the local priest let me paint in the church. You know, the room behind the altar? This is the Catholic church. But uh, I couldn't paint on Sunday morning, of course, which is OK. I just painted all the other times. And that gave me the idea of painting re religious subject matter. I don't believe in anything, of course. And I never have. I believe in traffic rules. <laughs> I believe in careful driving, uh, <laughs> trying to be happily married, <laughs> various things like that. Next. Oh, here's the first big Vietnam painting. Vietnam occurred to me when I got to the States and realized I needed new subject matter. By now, I'm living north of San Francisco about 18, 20 miles. Uh, what am I doing there? Well, my father died all of a sudden, and I think my mother felt lonely. By that time, I was married and had two children. Um, she said, if you move to California and live near me, I'll put the down payment on the house for you. And we thought, wowee, OK. Because quite frankly, the idea of living in a beautiful life in European cities had become boring. It become stupid, really. I wanted to be more involved somehow. I don't know why, I just did. I don't know why I was so isolated. Large parts of my life I've been isolated, and there's no good reason for it. I mean, I, there's nothing to matter. There's no reason why I need to be isolated. There's no reason for anything. It's just one of those things. This is the first large Vietnam picture. It's not that large. 
It's like the one in the Whitney. It, it, this precedes it by about 10 months. Next. Here's, here's the Vietnam paintings now. So I, I looked in the newspaper to see what was going on because I hadn't been in the States more than a few months. And guess what? Everything I needed was right there. Fresh subject matter, drugs, fantastic crimes being committed. For drugs, you know, people caught using drugs, sentenced to life in prison, that kind of thing. Murder, mayhem, and of course, Vietnam which was a tremendous thing. And also what else was going on? Oh, sexual revolution was going on at this time. Zap Comics started at this precise moment. <laughs> and let's see, I knew Crumb a little bit and S. Clay Wilson. But however, I never wanted to be a cartoonist. I want to be a cartoony artist, but I don't want to be a cartoonist. I don't think, I don't want to tie myself to a story. I want to just have random doings. This is random doings with GIs. Next. Here's San Francisco. Uh, this particular painting, I think it's probably 1967 or something like that. I don't know. Um, I don't memorize dates or anything. It's just making a wild guess. This particular painting was, uh, I'm running out of time, just a minute. Uh, five more minutes and I'll quit this. And if you have questions, you can ask me then. Um, I was interested in sort of US lifestyle, I guess you could say. It struck me as amusing, hilarious even. Next. Oh, yeah. oh boy. <laughs> well, you can tell I'm on the way to a divorce. <laughs> I don't mind the truth in art, but I don't demand it. You see, the thing is, I set myself free to do anything that might occur to me. Okay. I'll do anything that might occur to me. It could be true and it could be false, and it matters little to me. I like them both. I, I like true and I like the false. <laughs> okay, next. Some of these things do make me laugh. Here we have a leftist view of Vietnam, kind of, communist dame bashing up GIs, <laughs> mixed up with uh, sex. I like it when ideas collide. I love it. When ideas collide, it's like when you have an idea of women, wrong or right matters little, and then that, that collides with an idea of something else, like currency value or something really boring, you know what I mean? That's great. I like two or more ideas in a painting colliding. I think in a way I'm going to admit that I want to have fun when I paint and that I'm not really as serious as you would like me to be. Maybe, maybe you don't want me to be, I don't know, it doesn't matter, I'm not taking any advice. Next. <laughs> this is early, early, early. This is 1958. This is when I first got to Paris. And I was thinking of, uh, this is one of the first things, this is when I was tried for two weeks to be an abstract expressionist and found it was very easy. All you gotta do is splash around. <laughs> so having done that, I needed to have something in the picture. You can't just have a picture with splashes. I mean, that's already being done. So here I, I'm thinking of putting in kitchen machinery. This is supposed to be a washing machine. Next. Is there any more? We can go to the set, please. <laughs> we can go to which? Uh, do, oh, here, this. Hey, wait, leave that one on, leave that one on. Okay. I don't know what that mark is, shouldn't be there. You see that black mark under her mouth? That shouldn't be there. 
this was suggested to me because, oh, one of the things that was going on in California when I was living there, this is 1960, uh, 1964 to, um, mm, well, the critical time is the end of 70, 1970 about, is there was a great deal of psychology, psychological striving. I even met Fritz Perls, the ultimate shrink, uh, a friend of ours was his secretary mistress of all the crazy coincidences. So we went down to visit her, and we even got to meet the great Fritz Perls himself. And when he saw me, this is unfortunate, he burst out laughing. And I was very offended. But anyway, I got the idea of psychology in the picture. Really there, let's put the psychology in the picture. I mean, it's another thing like cartoon violence and everything else, let's get the psychology in. And everybody at this time was discovering their own psychology. A lot of people were discovering they'd been molested as children. Other people were discovering various things about themselves. Uh, frankly, I didn't make any d discoveries about myself, I don't think, that I didn't already know. In truth, I'm a rather t timid person, and, and this art, has the job of being bolder than I am. All of it does. Anyway, this was made in about 1969, something like that. I got the idea of really turning psychology loose. And you know, actually, in an odd way, these pictures are now becoming slightly popular. Don't ask me why. I mean, we're years later. We're nowhere near 1969. In 1969, when I showed these in New York, it was, generally speaking, not popular. Next. Here we have Angela Davis. Oh, da uh, here's something else that was sort of unpopular then. I don't know how it is now. A distortion of, of minorities. Minorities maybe don't like to be distorted for good reason, bad reason, or any reason. I'm not sure. I'm not inquiring. <laughs> so here we have various uh, social problems in San Francisco from the late uh, 60s, early 70s. Next. Oh, here's that famous art critic, Clement Greenberg. <laughs> joining, the, uh, joining the general parade of people with a problem. I, I did use myself, by the way. I made it up just like anybody else, you know. Next. Okay, well, having done that and having shown it and realizing that I'd gone way too far and sales were not only zero, but were like never to be, even though, I mean, I've made my share of non-commercial pictures. It was fun, frankly, but I decided to try and make friends with the art world to show a little interest in masterpieces. So here's Picasso's Guernica, done my way, you know. I mean, I'm just leaning on Picasso. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not showing respect or lack of respect, I don't think. Next, here's a modern home. I like architecture a lot. <laughs> it's just so crazy. The first one I ever did, I did because I met an architecture teacher. This is in Texas, and he said, uh, what the students do is, when they have a problem that they can't solve in the drawing, they put a, 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 a plant in front of it. <laughs> so, actually, I taught for 19 years, and uh, that probably is true. Next, here's Custer's Last Stand. This occurred to me, oh, uh, well, never mind. We're getting, I think I better, uh, how many slides do you have left and what's going on in that machine? I think I'll leave it at that point. And, and I think I'll invite, because it's been, it's 7.30, I, I think I'll invite 
anybody in the audience to ask any question if they wish to.